This video will give many of you everything you need to heal any injury you may encounter. I've had students go from having carpal tunnel so bad they needed a wrist brace just to type to doing regular handstands in under a month. From having a grade two hamstring tear to doing front splits in two weeks. But I'll be honest with you, some injuries will be easy to fix and some will be really hard. But there's a saying, the only condition for adaptability is that you're human and you're alive. In this video, I gave you guys a good overview of the thesis of my book and how pain really works. But I didn't tell you how to actually go about that process until now. But why did I have to come up with my own rehab? system here. In 2018, 220 pound judo black belt throws me full on and we both land on my right shoulder during the roll. It's not the first time I've taken down hard, but I notice I can't really move my shoulder. At that point, I had already had a lot of success with rehab for my own injuries and for my clients and students. So I go drive to the gym and I spend an hour and a half trying all this stuff. Man, it feels like I'm trying everything and nothing is helping. I even go to the treadmill, walking three miles per hour. It hurts. Two miles per hour. Still hurts. Half a mile an hour, literally grandma pace, still hurts. At this point, I'm like, screw this. I'm out of here, this isn't working, fuck my life. Go to bed and I wake up at 4 a.m. I start to move and bam, excruciating pain. Like I would be writhing around in pain, except it hurts to move. Now I'm basically having a full on existential crisis. Not because of the physical pain, but because of what this pain symbolized. An injury I couldn't fix by myself. Surgery, risk of my shoulder never being the same again. Months without the movements and activities that I had not only fallen in love with, but it also become my profession and source of financial stability. But I had a thought, what if I try a few external rotations here? I do one, feels fine. Two more, feels fine. So I keep going, I do two sets of 15, and guess what, it hurts a lot less. So I'm like, okay, we're back in the game. So the next morning, I started the rehab quite seriously. I set a timer to repeat every hour and created a routine made up of movements that either made it feel better or at the very least did not make it feel worse. And the idea was simple, address everything I could structurally. I made good progress for a while, started getting some strength back, and after a month, I was feeling better enough that I went back to jujitsu again. I was careful and I tied my arm with my belt to ensure I didn't use my shoulder. After a month, I was able to start beating some people with just the one arm, which was really exciting. But after a few months, I started giving up and just accepting that my shoulder would never be as strong as it was. In the middle of all this, one of my students hurts her knee. So I'm guiding her through the rehab process. She's doing really well and mostly recovered when she comes up to me and she's like, so what's going on with the shoulder? I tell her, I don't know if I'll ever have all my strength back and I don't think the shoulder will ever be the same and that's fine. She goes, well, you know, if you can't fix your shoulder, then I don't know if I'll ever be able to fix my knee 100%. There's one thing in this world that motivates me more than any other, and that's being a good example for my students. I go home that night and I'm just like, my students' injuries and their motivation depends on me being able to fix mine. I'll tell you more about what got me to being able to do this, this, and this again without ever needing surgery. But first, it's time to give you guys what you've been waiting for and what I have been working for years and am so proud to finally give you. My method for effectively healing any injury by yourself after a quick word from this video's very generous and incredibly handsome sponsor, me. Have you been looking for quality online movement instruction but you can't afford the financial or time and energy requirements of online coaching? Well, you're in luck because my channel memberships are unlike anything else out there and will give you access to the best tools your development as a mover. We have three separate tiers. Tier one has access to foundational movements and exercises. Tier two adds the entirety of my private online coaching video library. And tier three adds a full catalog of over 120 full length movement classes. And all of these include access to a private Discord server with me. And you'll be supporting me in my dream of giving the world access to real movement education. There are a total of six steps in the mover's method. Think of rehab like a back and forth conversation that you're having with your body. Each of these steps should be considered a small part of a much larger discussion on what the two of you should do next. We are tinkerers, so we want to test everything. Often, the results will be something you would never guess. After hurting my shoulder, I was able to comfortably do freestanding handstands almost a month before I was able to lift my arm overhead without weight. Don't be constrained by logic. I want you to test everything. I cannot overstate the importance of this because I see people make this mistake constantly. Don't push too hard while testing. The absolute last thing we want to do is exacerbate the injury when we're just trying to gather information. You'll be in twice the trouble too since if you make the injury significantly worse during testing, the previous information you gather may become inaccurate and harmful. With the mover's method, you don't need to spend thousands or tens of thousands of dollars on imaging, fancy PRP injections, or stem cell treatments. What you need is to learn how to work with your body in the particular injury you're dealing with. That is the goal I have for all of you to take with you for the rest of your lives. I don't want to give you a fish, I want to teach you how to fish. Step one, make an assessment of cause. Knowing what caused the injury is an extremely important thing. Patellar tendonitis is often called jumper's knee because it's common in jumper's 
jumping athletes whose sports require repetitive, extremely high loading on the patellar tendon. By the way, tendonitis technically doesn't exist anymore and has been reclassified as tendinosis, which is damage to the tendon without pain, and tendinopathy, which is damage to the tissue with pain. But patellar tendonitis is also often referred to as moviegoer's knee because it's common for people who sit for long periods of time. Having the same injury in the same place at the same intensity for the same length of time and these two different scenarios should be thought of and approached with a very different mindset. Making an assessment will give us a guide for what the injury will be most sensitive to as well as where. In more severe cases, we might completely avoid these until the injury is mostly recovered or in minor cases, we might habituate the mechanism of injury directly. Habituation is a technical term that means we are decreasing the pain you feel by repeatedly exposing your body to the pain generating stimulus. This is the main mechanism by which good rehab works. And it's the main reason your body will almost always feel better when you get out of bed in the morning or after you warm up in a workout. Either way, the origin of the injury is central. If we can get you to the point where you can do exactly the thing that injured you at the same or higher level of performance, we will have finished the rehab process. Everything else, that is all of the more minor sensitizations will generally have been taken care of indirectly through this. Step two, observe your pain-free ability. Usually the first thing I'll test is the active range of the injured joint. What range of motion do you have access to without pain? Does this range feel strong or weak? Active range is quite simply the range of motion using only the involved joints. For example, passive hamstring flexibility might be tested by pulling my foot towards my head, while active flexibility or mobility would be how high I can lift my foot without external assistance. Passive range is usually reasonably larger than active range, so no need to panic if that's the case for you. It's quite normal, although you may want to work on narrowing this gap since good mobility is considered a pretty important benchmark for healthy bodies. Since the active range will be smaller than the passive range, it's usually a good idea to test this first. Always a better idea to start conservatively until we are sure that what we're doing is helpful. Gently move the joint around, testing all the potential ranges of motion. If and when a certain position is painful, simply stop. There's no need to keep pushing. Relax. Make a note of where it is, where it became painful, and at what intensity. Next is the passive range of motion. To test it, you can use a partner, external object, for instance, a wall or a bar to hang off of, even another the limb, for instance, a healthy arm to move an injured arm. You want to pay special attention to any areas where the pain-free passive range of motion is much larger than the active range of motion. These are often areas where you'll be able to quickly and dramatically recover function of the joint. You also want to pay attention to how the injury feels after using this extra range of motion. Here's a very common example. For those with shoulder injuries, I often prescribe hanging. Almost universally, people can get their arms much higher overhead without pain while approaching a hang than just by lifting their arms straight up. You'll want to pay very close attention to the following. How much does the active pain-free range of motion change after getting into this deeper position? Does it open up, stay the same, or close down? Make sure to test for every vector and action of the joint because they will often be dramatically different for no discernible reason. How much longitudinal load can the joint handle at each of the possible positions? For instance, with the shoulder or scapula, we can test loading in the plank position, crab walk position, or arms overhead in a handstand or a hang. These can all be tested with compressive forces pushing together or tensile forces pulling away. The results will often be surprising. Once I had a back injury that was so severe that I could not stand or even lie down without an immense amount of pain. I went through the mover's method, steadily improving my range of motion and decreasing sensitivity. By the morning of my third day, I felt I was ready to try deadlifting. Before, even a slight bend forward proved to be impossible. So it was a big deal that I was finally able to reach down to even grab a barbell. To my surprise, upon lifting a 45 pound barbell, I immediately and dramatically felt much better. Just holding the weight made my back feel so good, I quickly increased the weight to 135 pounds, which was even more helpful than the empty bar. I walked out of the gym after that short 20 minute deadlift session, feeling 10 times better than before. I was able to comfortably resume training just a week later. Ever since that injury and rehab process, loading has been one of my absolute favorite rehab tools and has worked again and again Again, for my family, my students, and myself. Next, what forces can the injured and surrounding joints produce without pain? By now, you'll have a good idea of how serious the injury is, as well as what ranges of motion seem most sensitive. Work within this understanding to continue your investigation and find where you can exert force pain-free. Remember, there are three main types of muscular contractions. Isometric, muscle contracts and stays the same length. Concentric, muscle contracts and shortens. And eccentric, muscle contracts and lengthens. These are each fundamentally different at a biochemical level, and if needed, should be tested independently of one another. Often isometrics can be quite helpful and pain-free even when concentric and eccentric contractions are not. And this randomized controlled trial showed dramatically improved rehab times with a program based on eccentrics versus just normal reps. It's worth noting that muscles are usually capable of producing the most force in eccentric contractions, less during isometric contractions, and the least during concentric contractions. Remember to test different ranges of motion in all possible vectors. Don't forget to test the surrounding joints as well. 
Step three, various things may help and hinder. This is a big step where you'll spend the bulk of your time. Honestly, guys, good rehab isn't about the movements you're doing, it's about how you're doing them. I don't mean in some abstract body awareness, mind muscle connection, floofy way, you yogis. Look, say you, Ronnie Coleman, hurt your back doing three squats at 600 pounds. Do you need to do a joint by joint movement assessment to see if a left right asymmetry in your quad to hamstring ratio caused a super compensatory shift in your lumbo pelvic hip complex that was the root cause of your injury? No, it's a pseudo scientific waste of your time and energy anyway, because you're gonna be wrong and operating off of outdated paradigms. You can rehab by doing the same squats at a lighter weight for higher reps and do a great job, never even need a second exercise. Alternatively, you can do the Ronnie Coleman and keep grinding out more reps. Take a look at what Ronnie Coleman is up to these days. 13 back surgeries and still has horrible chronic pain all the time. When I first got out of the hospital, both of my legs were numb. Now I got to the point where just one is numb. Or you could rehab with the lighter weight, never increase it and never get your strength back. If you nail this step, your rehab will progress faster than you ever thought possible. Real success here will usually mean dramatic progress day to day. And when that progress compounds over weeks and months, you'll be able to make not only a quick full recovery, but you'll also be well equipped to deal with similar injuries for the rest of your life. With that being said, I have good and bad news for you. Here's bad news. It's very hard to give precise rules for you to follow as far as exactly what or how to go about your rehab process. There are hundreds of different ideas people will go suggest you do. Unfortunately, very few of these, if any, meet the two main requirements for this video. Working in practice over the long term, and at a minimum, not being refuted by the research. But the good news, since pain is governed by the brain, almost any method might work for you. For instance, I don't recommend chiropractic adjustments or massage or foam rolling because the bulk of the literature shows little or no effect. But many people will swear that it's worked for them, sometimes dramatically so. You might even find acupuncture, energy healing, or hypnosis does the trick. However, the focus of this video is not just on what things might work for some people, but what concepts should work for everyone? What are the best methods? How do we utilize them the most effectively? And how do we adjust them or pivot if they don't seem to be working? So what should we do? The biggest thing I want you to focus on is strength training. Gradually build your volume and work to strengthen your muscles, tendons, ligaments, and bones. Don't half-ass a boring elastic band routine for 20 minutes and call it a day. Challenge yourself within your limits. Strengthen the injured area, strengthen the healthy areas. Find ways to challenge your cardiovascular system that work around your injury. Work on mobility by focusing on the joints joints that are sensitive and the joints that are healthy. A lot of people use injuries as an excuse to take time off from training or practice because they think their body needs time to rest. Doesn't work that way. Immobilize a healthy elbow for six weeks so it can completely rest and watch it calcify, atrophy, sensitize, and lock up. It'll potentially never be the same for the rest of your life. We need to create demand if we want an adaptation. However, we also need to balance this demand with what our body can tolerate right now. Rest is a tool that while heavily overused in common rehab processes, has a role to play that is absolutely irreversible. That role is your backup parachute. Before we go into that though, we need to first define what rest is. This problem and its practical cousin, how we should use rest, are much more challenging than they may seem. Many people will equate rest with sleep, but while all sleep is rest, not all rest is sleep. I think everyone can agree that almost all meditation and breathing exercises count as rest. But what about going for a walk, a light bike ride? How about watching a movie? What about bed rest, being essentially confined to a bed all day for days or weeks on end? What about playing an intense game of chess or studying? The relevant definition of rest is to cease from action or motion, refrain from labor or exertion. People will say and believe that when the body is injured, it simply needs time to heal. The problem is, your body doesn't have a heal button. Just like how your body isn't gonna automatically go stronger or build muscle because you really want it to, it responds to stimuli in proportion to how demanding they are. All injuries are stimuli for your body to recover and rebuild tissue, but not necessarily a large stimulus. You wanna give your body sleep, focus, care, and the proper resources it needs to rebuild tissue and desensitize. But if you just lather a big wad of rest on every injury, as most doctors seem to recommend these days, You'll notice several large downsides to that strategy. Give the injured body part no stimulus whatsoever, and you'll find that not only will the body not want to recover to the same degree, there's no reason to, the body and all its tissues will atrophy while you rest, and the systems that drive recovery themselves are crippled without movement. Without muscle contractions and movement, blood and lymph stagnates. Inflammation, of which there will be plenty depending on the severity of the injury, will have no means by which to be processed without the lymphatic system working properly. Then when you're ready to return to your sport or activity or daily living, you'll notice a much larger gap between your previous and current abilities, strength, mobility, cardio, movement intelligence, and work capacity, all of which put you at a larger risk of re-injury during the most dangerous part of your rehab. The only three good studies I could find after an enormous amount of effort all showed that starting your rehab earlier, less rest, 
is more helpful. I recommend for any serious injury, you should take the first day to rest and protect the injury while it sensitizes, get a good night's sleep and begin your work potentially the next day. Although immediately after the injury, you can use ice and other passive methods to desensitize and reduce the pain. It's almost universal that an injury will not feel very serious while you're training, or especially if you're competing, but later as the adrenaline focus, arousal, and general warmth of hard training cool off, things that might not have hurt at all before sometimes become incredibly painful, especially overnight as your body will have ample time to start the inflammatory processes and send macrophages and T cells of the immune system in to start the recovery process. Bayesian reasoning, if it doesn't turn out to be so bad, no worries, you didn't miss much and you can get on with the rehab the next day. But if it is serious, those exercises you didn't do when you didn't know the severity of the injury could turn out to have saved you several days or even weeks of rehab. For any serious injury, one of your first main goals is to decrease the swelling, if any. While inflammation has been demonized in the popular health media, if such a complex system wasn't helpful for our survival as a species, it wouldn't have evolved in the first place. Inflammation is part of the complex biological response of the body to harmful stimuli and is a protective response response involving immune cells, blood vessels, and molecular mediators. The function of inflammation is to eliminate the initial cause of cell injury and the inflammatory processes initiate tissue repair. This is where certain rehab exercises will help. Now for any injury, you can go through any and all exercises that use nearby joints and surrounding muscles. And in the future, I will organize all of the most effective exercises, movements, and stretches I use for rehab in the channel memberships for you. All you have to do is find the section that has your injury in it. No need for a formal diagnosis. We can just use the location of the sensitive area. Start with the first exercise listed, get a very conservative load, and try the starting position. Does it hurt? If so, don't worry. As long as it isn't too painful, we can still give it a try. Pay careful attention as you start the movement. Does the pain get any worse? If so, immediately drop the exercise and move on to the next one down the list. If it doesn't hurt, but it doesn't feel helpful either, this is probably still helpful in the long term as it is a still a stimulus for adaptation, but we're ideally looking for exercises that have an immediate noticeable improvement. When you find an exercise that makes your injury feel noticeably better after doing it, success. Now, repeat that exercise for at least a few more sets so you can find a dose response. That is, if one set is helpful, then are two sets twice as helpful? Where does the process level off and is there a point where doing more sets makes it feel worse? Write all this down. You want to keep track of everything that helps and everything that doesn't. Keep in mind that with some injuries, you won't won't know until the next day if you've sensitized it. Be extra careful until you've figured this out. Hint, these are usually the injuries that aren't serious enough to cause pain throughout the day. Continue working your way through the exercises and hopefully you will have found plenty of fantastic, helpful exercises. If you aren't able to find anything helpful, don't worry. Just do your best to make sure you're minimizing or eliminating everything that's sensitizing your injury further and will actually want you to move on to the next step. Don't forget about good sleep and nutrition. They're powerful tools to have in your arsenal and doing well with these will never hurt you and always support your progress. Not only will great sleep help you immediately feel less pain, but it will also help you get the most progress out of the exercises you're doing. Great nutrition will reduce chronic and systemic inflammation that can get in the way of adaptation, help you sleep better, think clearer, and give your body all the building blocks it needs to rebuild build and gain muscle and connective tissue. As you go through the exercises, make sure you take notes on everything you do, how you did it, what weight, tempo, rep range, or sets, and how it felt during and after. For those of you with chronic injuries that have lasted for years, some of these rehab protocols will seem like tricky, ever evolving, high stakes puzzles. To give yourself a fighting chance, take good notes and make them as detailed as possible. If it gets overwhelming, keep it simple. If the pain fluctuates on certain days or times, something is causing those fluctuations. And if you can figure out what they are, you can start to control them and force them into your favor. Organize all the helpful exercises you found into a circuit to do every day, even two or three times a day or more. Exercises that made it worse will be useful as well, and we'll take a look at them in the next step. Step four, eliminate weaknesses. This is the step where we'll rebuild tolerance to most sensitive movements and positions. There are two ways we can get to the step, although the process is not a simple binary one, but rather a continuum along which we can fall anywhere. The first case is ideal. We have found our rehab exercises that work, perform them diligently, and now, having dramatically improved the injury, we are ready to move on in the direction of anti-fragility to further increase our capability. The second case is much harder. We were forced to skip a step because we were unable to figure out any movements, exercises, or positions that were helpful. In this case, or the closer we are to this case on the spectrum between the two, we'll need to be much more conservative, potentially even spending a few days focusing on sleeping and avoiding anything that might sensitize the injury before retesting to see if any of the exercises have become helpful. The approach for both cases is to slowly build the body's capacity to tolerate volume and load 
with what currently are or formerly were sensitizing movements. For example, I had an elbow injury that was quite sensitive to a number of things, but I found some exercises that helped and started doing them twice a day. In just a few days, my elbows felt much better and I decided to try chin-ups again. Previously, just one rep was enough to cause a five on a one to 10 scale of pain. Too much for me to work with, but now, when I had tried it after a good warm up of rehab exercises, the pain decreased to a three. The next day I tried one more again, two out of 10 pain. Excellent. The next day I was able to do one rep in the morning and one rep in the evening, both at 1.5. The day after two reps in the morning and one rep in the evening at two out of 10. A week later, two sets of five reps, no pain. You get the idea. It may seem like we're playing with fire by doing exercises we know can make our injury worse, but we can counter that risk with patience, intelligence, and sleep. If you've come to this step because you couldn't find any helpful exercises in the previous step, try just a very small amount of one of those exercises that make it worse at a very light intensity, and then wait until the next day to try it again. When we feel we've progressed far enough that the risk of serious re-injury falls within an acceptable range, we can consider moving to the next step by going back to the activity that initially caused the injury. How we measure this risk will depend in large part on how risky and chaotic the situation that caused our injury was. If you're a professional athlete or you need to compete or perform to make a living, this might often mean we'll have to compete with the injury even when we know it will make it worse. Hurt doesn't mean harm, and doing this within a degree of moderation doesn't mean anything ridiculous like you're screwing up your body beyond repair. However, we wanna prepare absolutely as best as we can so that we can minimize the risk of re-injury and minimize the severity of re-injury if it were to occur. However, even if we aren't professional athletes, we all have certain activities that we love to do, and likely the cause of your injury is from one of those activities. I cannot urge you enough. Do not return to recklessly performing these activities in the same manner and in intensity that caused them simply because you miss them. Channel your frustration and use that energy to fuel your rehab process. You can safely and intelligently start reintroducing your sport when you are ready. Step five, return to sport. This is yet another area where people really screw up. The standard protocol seems to be, oh, you're hurt? Take a month off and rest and take some ibuprofen. Then go back to X activity that you got injured in. I hope we've covered enough so far that you can see how ridiculous this is. Going back to your sport after a month of inactivity will not turn out well at all. No matter how gradually you reintroduce yourself back to the sport, your body will be much weaker and a serious re-injury becomes much more likely. This is a big sticking point for a lot of people. Even if they do everything else right, getting re-injured and having to start the whole rehab rest process happens all too often. However, if we're smart, we can far surpass the status quo. How to do this is a bit tricky because a lot of the best practices available will drastically vary depending on your injury and sport. Ideally, as we're moving through the movers method, we're able to run through the step in parallel without any risk of re-injury by modifying the activity to avoid the injured joint. Imagine you're a dancer and you've just had an almost unimaginably catastrophic injury. You've completely torn your ACL in both knees. Do you really wanna take nine months off from dancing just because you can't use your legs? No, and we don't have to either. Dance is a great example because it's easy to modify the activity so you can focus on different things. We can't yet load the legs, no problem. While we do our rehab, we can also work on dancing with the spine and upper body. Not only will this allow you to mitigate the skill and physicality decay that seems almost inherent to injuries, but we can use the injury to force us to develop new skills. When we finish our recovery, these new skills may even become our greatest strength. I'll give an example from my shoulder injury in jiu-jitsu. In the beginning, it was far too sensitive to tolerate any permutation of jiu-jitsu. Even just moving it without any load was painful and the range of motion was pitiful. My injury originated from a throw from the end. So when I came back, I did absolutely no standing work. I love standing up, snagging those single and double legs, but I was unwilling to tolerate any risk of being thrown, taken down, or tripped at any magnitude. I started with only drilling and very light sparring, all of it with my injured arm tied to my belt. I told told every single person I rolled or drilled with that I had hurt my shoulder so we could both be extra careful of it. And just like that, I did a month of jujitsu using only one arm, all the while slowly and carefully progressing in intensity. And actually, it was a wonderful experience. I learned how to become more coordinated with my left arm. I learned how difficult many things are to do with one arm, but I also learned so much about using my legs and hip positioning that I never would have learned otherwise. Near the end of the month, when I had healed enough to use both arms again, my technique had improved so much thanks to this injury that I knew there was much more to learn through it. As wonderful as this experience was, it only worked because I was very careful. This sort of strategy will backfire if you don't have the coordination and self-control 
to keep yourself from getting re-injured. If you're at the point where you feel it's time to go back to your sport, here's some questions you'll want to ask yourself. How chaotic is the activity? How much control do I have over what happens to me? And what actions can I take, if any, to increase that control? One of the biggest things this comes down to is whether or not other people are involved. If so, are they working with or against me? What's the risk of collision or a repeat of the accident that caused your injury in the first place? What modifications can I make to the activity? Can I work on a different skills that aren't at odds with my injury right now? In the dance example earlier, we have a crippling lower body injury. We can still do plenty of upper body movements. Are you able to do this in a productive manner for your activity? If you've got a good understanding of your sport and a little bit of creativity, it should almost always be possible to some degree. In Olympic weightlifting, for instance, you might have a wrist injury that prevents you from properly training intensity with a clean snatch and front rack position. However, in many cases, this should not prevent you from training related movements such as back squats and deadlifts to your heart's desire. In boxing, if we imagine a fighter with a concussion or other impact related injury, he can always try shadow boxing, working on timing, technique, or footwork against an imaginary opponent. In men's gymnastics, if we imagine a gymnast with an ankle injury, can't work on acrobatics yet, can always take advantage of this opportunity to improve strength skills, balance, and flexibility. Always remember the rule of specificity. We're trying to stay close to the movements we want to do with this phase of training. But in a worst case scenario, you can always visualize. There's a plethora of research on the incredible effects of imagery in training that I detail in this video here. Can I control the intensity of the activity? With some sports, this is going to be a lot easier than others. Powerlifting and Olympic weightlifting are just about perfect. We can do 50%, 25%, or 24.35% of the normal weight and progress at whatever increments we want. If five pound jumps are too much, remember fractional plates are an incredible tool and we can go as small as half pound increments without any trouble. In this way, CGS sports, where performance is measured in centimeters, grams, or seconds, are extremely well suited to this line of modification. If you used to be able to do the 100 meter dash in 15 seconds all out, can you do it in 30 without pain? What about 35? Make it two minutes if you need to. Some sports are going to be much trickier. In gymnastics, how do you decrease the intensity of a backflip? A certain minimum amount of explosiveness required to take off and not land on your head. Perhaps we can start on the easiest Olympic grade trampoline with a huge amount of stretch to spread out the impact and takeoff forces over time. We might then work down a series of smaller and smaller cushions to take off and land from. Larger team sports may prove challenging. If your team is willing to slow things down for you for a while, excellent. But most likely, we'll have to use other methods. For instance, in soccer, we can work work on dribbling, ball skills, conditioning, and many other things on our own until we're able to start playing again. When we're ready to start back up, remember you can control the intensity you play at. You may want to sprint to the ball to keep in bounds, but if you know the chance of re-injury is quite high, don't do it. I've been this guy more times than I care to admit in many sports. And I can tell you from so much experience that it is not worth it. I know it's easier said than done, but be smart. If you have to, let the ball go out of bounds and sacrifice a point or the game. Your focus is to get back to your 100% quickly so you can play your heart out again and enjoy the incredible beauty and movement your body is capable of long after the game is over. Once you've successfully figured out the modifications that allow you to restart your sport without sacrificing the speed and trajectory of your recovery, we enter the final stage of rehab. This should be the easiest part. The modifications in hand along with detailed notes on your practice, how much of what you are doing at what intensity and how does it feel? The next step is to gradually increase the volume and intensity of those sport related work until you reach the full capacity you were at before. To be more conservative, it's best to only increase one thing at a time. I suggest you start by first building back up the volume, then building the intensity second. A larger volume will help drive gains in intensity and skill. Sometimes, you'll be able to progress smoothly from start to finish. And this is very possible for many light and moderate injuries, However, it's unlikely to happen for severe or chronic injuries, especially if you're trying to reacclimatize to a demanding or chaotic sport in parallel. Don't get discouraged. Sometimes you're doing great for a while, as I was after dislocating my pinky years ago when a Mikey Roll special. Bam, I accidentally hit my finger on the side of a doorway. One moment of a lapse of attention and suddenly I lost weeks worth of progress. Keep your head up the best you can and get back to the solution. Often a serious injury, let's say two weeks worth of progress or more, may change what exercises work for you and which don't. Be aware of this. Feeling sorry for yourself and not doing your exercises isn't gonna make it better. Step six, strengthen past baseline. I've told you all about many things that simply don't predict or have little to nothing to do with causing injuries or pain that you don't need to be worried about. That said, the number one risk factor for an injury is previously having that injury. This means that when we've completed the first five steps of the mover's method and successfully reintegrated all activities, even the one that caused the injury in the first place, our work isn't done, not completely. We need to make you stronger than before to reduce this increased risk of injury as much as possible. This usually means picking two or three of your best rehab exercises and continue performing them two to three times a week. Think of it like brushing your teeth. It's something that's good to do in the long term, especially for those of you that have been dealing with this 
this injury for a long time. And even if you do end up getting hurt again, continuing to do these exercises will mean that its severity will be drastically reduced and the bulk of the work is already done just by figuring out which exercises worked for you the first time. What ended up being a complete game changer for me and what my method is based on is that I started a pain and injury log. I'd already been recording my workouts in the notebook for years. I highly recommend you all do and I basically require my students to do. But now I also added various notations after each exercise to quantify how my shoulder felt after each set before and after each workout. This was key because now I had a way to clearly track what was helping the most and what was not. I started weeding out the exercises that were a waste of time and I was even able to adjust the ones that worked to make them even better. The hardest thing to do is to figure out the right stimulus to promote the best recovery. And that's why recording everything during this process is so valuable. At the end of the process, I also had hundreds of notes and observations to refer back to should I ever re-injure my shoulder again. As a bonus, these notes also forced me to see that I was making progress on the days when it felt like I wasn't. It's not so easy to give up when you can see how far you've already come. One of the beautiful things about movement is how much it teaches you to be in tune with your own body. And the mover's method turns what can be confusing, painful, and demoralizing injuries into a quantifiable, measurable opportunity to listen to your body and hear what it needs to recover. Your injury may feel debilitating, but never believe it's too much for you to handle. It's not. Think of it as another movement puzzle for you to solve. Our bodies are really, really good at doing exactly that if you give them a reason to. You can heal your injuries and it's not too late no matter how long you've had them or how old you are. My book is still a work in progress, but I want to give you all a chance to download its accompanying workshops in exchange for feedback on how they help you with your rehab. They're built off the original version I used when I was rehabbing my shoulder. And I'd love to hear what you think and get your help to refine them and improve them if possible. If you want to see my first pain science video where I describe all the conceptual underpinnings of pain, injury, and this method, watch this video. Subscribe. Play basketball. I can easily get anyone to knee shins that are physically impossible to hurt from playing basketball. <sighs> okay. okay.